Afternoon, everybody. Uh, sorry about the delay here. <clears throat> As you know, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already, because he does not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But as many as received him, to them he gave them the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, for by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. All right, before we get into the word of God this afternoon, let's pause for a moment of silence and exercise 1 John 1, 9, which says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's just pause for a moment of silence and then we'll begin our class. Let us pray. Or let's pause for a moment of silence and use 1 John 1, 9. <clears throat> Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity to get into your word this afternoon. We know that this is critical. We know that this is vital for us as believers in Christ. This is our spiritual food. This is how we regain, or this is how we gain the spiritual strength that is required for us to navigate through the year 2024. And not only that, to be able to live the spiritual life under your influence, under your empowerment. Help us now to focus on the information that we're going to look at this afternoon. And if there's anything vying for our attention, I just pray that we would be disciplined enough to lay those aside so that we can focus on the information that we have before us. And we ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to move through Revelation. We left off on uh, actually verse 6, but I just toggled back to verse 5 so that we can just see again where we left off. Remember, he says, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And I was referring to, that's referring to righteousness. That is a sense of when you live a life of uh, righteousness and holiness, you're going to be recognized uh, for that. And you're going to be clothed in white. We saw that last week. So white clothes for the one who conquers represents the garments required for a special event like a gown or tuxedo, tuxedo of today. The promise to never erase his name from the book of life is not a reference to eternal life because every believer has a secure place in heaven. Instead, the names in this book are invitees to special fellowship uh, with God. The Lord is not with God. The Lord is not making a veiled threat that unfaithful believers will wind up in hell. Rather, he is using a figure of speech. So he who will cover, overcome shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So that's going to be a spectacular recognition for those who have overcome. It's kind of like, like what we see in Matthew 10, where Jesus says, whoever denies me, I'll deny before the Father. Whoever confesses me for the before men, I will confess before my heavenly Father. So it's a special recognition for those who are going the extra mile. And so it's not a loss of um, salvation, but re rather a special recognition. So you see that in, again, Matthew 10, where he's talking to his disciples. And we have another... Um, where he says it here in Revelation 3, 5. And then moving on to verse 6, which is where we left off last week. We have what we, we have. You'll recall, he who has an ear, let him, let him hear what the Spirit says to the Lord. The idea here again is to hear this warning against having a religious profession without ever having a relationship with Christ. This is a recurring message to all seven churches and emphasizes believers to be receptive to the teaching and messages of the Holy Spirit, urging them to apply the faith in the context of their community. 
So he's saying, look, you have ears, right? So pay attention. Listen to what I'm saying. Don't just listen to your own, your, your, uh, the word that uh, is being said to your church, but listen to what's being said in all the churches. So the instructions here is very informative for everyone to pay attention, especially for us uh, as believers in Christ, 21st century. So we are to pay attention and listen closely because there's a lot of content, a lot of information that we as believers in Christ, we as a church body can listen and learn from. Because as I'd mentioned the last several Sundays, the information that's found in Revelation is designed to invoke the response, elicit a response from us as believers so that as we tune in and listen to what God's word is saying, we can make specific adjustments in our lives, thus being able to be consistent with what the word of God has to say. So basic bottom line is pay attention. Who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Verse seven now is speaking to the church of Philadelphia, right? And the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? So the idea here is the church in Philadelphia, although small, we're going to see, and viewed by the world as insignificant, was spiritually serious, meaning that they were playing ball. They were really paying, taking action. They knew what to do as a local church because they were focused on the word, focused on what the scripture had to say so that they were making an advance and moving forward as the scripture uh, records for them and for us as well. They were committed. We're going to see this in verse 8. Except for the church at Smyrna, this was the only church not to receive a rebuke from Jesus. So even though this church had a little worldly power, Jesus promised to reward their faithfulness by overruling the satanic enemies that came against them. So you'll notice that, again, there's specific information that's recorded for us to see how God's omniscience, his omnipresence, what he says, how sovereign he remains. You, you see what he says and what he records for us so that the churches that are going through dilemmas and challenges, we see what they go through and then the word of God communicates to them, communicates to us how God steps in, intervenes, and he takes note of what they're going through and then he provides a solution then right then and there and for us as well. So here you'll notice that there's a, when you follow through in chapter three, especially, especially to the specific churches, you'll notice very the, the details that are recorded for us so that you can note that the scripture, when making mention of these specific churches, is very detailed and tells us what these churches had to undergo. So this, this church here is considered small, and yet small didn't mean anything in the hands of God because they were rock and rolling. They were advancing the cause of Christ. They were, they were able to advance the information, the doctrine that they held dearly to. And so they were making spiritual advance. They were faithful. And so you're going to see, let's just move on to the next verse. These things says he who is holy, referring to Christ. He who is true. He who has the key of David. He who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. So again, the only one who has that supreme power is God himself. And so the note here is the congregation of Philadelphia was small yet its members had little strength to oppose the forces of evil, yet they had kept my word and not denied my name. So you see that even though the numbers were few, what's recorded is that they, they had little strength, kind of like in some of the churches in America today, they're not very large, they're not very, they don't have uh, thousands and thousands of members, and yet they continued to stand firmly on the truth of God's word. They had kept his word and not denied his name. And so you see that God 
is observant and he makes note of that and he records it for us. And so it's interesting how the record is very up to date and current, even though the material was written years and years ago, we have the word of God that transcends and continues to be accurate to the very detail, not only in prophecy, but things in the past and things in the future. So it's an unveiling of truth even before it even happens. And even when it has happened, it's recorded for us to grow and to learn from so that we can say, you know, the scripture is consistent. The things that were there, the things that he has said to the believers back then stands true today. And even back then, when it hasn't even materialized or when it has materialized, it's still relevant for us as believers. So you can see he has the supremacy. He has the key of David. He who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. There's this. There's only one person ha that has the last say. And that's the sense that you get when you watch closely what's being communicated in this last book of the Bible. And he goes on to say, verse 9, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not. They're lying. But lie, indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. So the idea here is those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie for this description of their enemies. And you'll see this in verse two, chapter 2, verse 9. If you go back, you'll recall that there was something similar to what we just read here. Here adds, but they lie. This either infers to the preaching opportunities and you'll see the word keys in Matthew 16, 19, where they agree and whatever you agree to, it's agreed to in heaven. Whatever you loose here on earth, it's loosed in heaven. So you can see that the church has authority here on this earth because this is what's called a divine institution that has been authorized by God himself. So whatever we bind here on earth, it's bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth, it's loosed in heaven. So there's this authority that, that just undergirds the local church. And so as we assemble together, as we are pulling together, as we're focused together on him and his word, there is a sense of authority that is displayed through scripture and in the authority of the local churches today. It's very, very important. You see this in the record, the book itself, the whole, Holy Writ. So then there's entrance into the, the Messianic banquet. So this could either refer to preaching opportunities, the Messianic banquet, clothed in white. You saw, we saw this in verse four, four, a divine opportunity for service, the promise of making them worship at the feet of the faithful, emphasizes the divine vindication and the recognition of God's love for those who, let me see one second here. For those who remain, remain steadfast. So you see that in chapter three, actually. So... Because you have kept my command, listen closely to this one, verse 10. Because you have kept my command to persevere, that, pers that word persevere has the idea of going on, enduring, remaining steadfast, regardless. You've kept my command to persevere, to keep pressing on. I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So notice that I will keep you from the hour of trial. So this particular church will be spared from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. 
So within the pre-mill view of eschatology, which is our view as a local church, there are at least four different views on the rapture. So this is where we're going and moving through. After we pass through chapter three, we're almost done with chapter three. We're about to hit chapter four. You're going to notice that there's no mention of the local church anymore. The, these seven churches are gone. The churches are no longer mentioned in chapter four. Why? Why is it silent? Well, you're going to see why as we get through chapter four, and we're going to expound on that. But for now, some pre-mills, premillennialists believe that the rapture will occur prior to the seven-year period of tribulation, which is what we believe. Some believe it will occur in the middle of the tribulation. Some say it will happen two-thirds of the way through, and some insist that it will come at the very back end. This verse suggests that a pre-trib rapture, because it says, I will keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come to the whole earth. Jesus will not merely keep them from the test, but listen to this, but will keep them from the period of the test. That's the tribulation period. So I will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole earth. We are going to be spared from that test, but everybody else is going to have to go through that hour of trial. And so as we go through chapter three and on, you're going to see that the, the world is going to go through a lot of hurt, massive hurt. And I know we've seen some of this, a snapshot of some of this in the past. So we looked at that before we got into the verses from chapter one, two, and three, but we saw portions of chapter six, seven, and eight, and even 20. So we, we had a preview of what's coming forth. And so I, we, I tease you a little bit so you can see, remember the giant locust, the horses, and all of that stuff, the, the sci-fi that's forthcoming. But that's frightening. You're going to see some things. We'll, we'll try to dive a little deeper and we're going to tighten it up a little bit. So aside from the images on the slides that I put on the PowerPoint, we're going to zoom in on the text itself and we're going to lift it from the text and we're going to zoom in and see what it actually says and what it actually means aside from just what I showed you uh, last year, a year and a half ago. Maybe it was a year, year, yeah, a year and a half ago. So he's going to keep us from the tribulation period. We're not going to have to weather the storm. We're not going to have to go through that period of testing and trial, the hour of trial. We're spared from that. Why? Because we're his family. We're his sons and daughters of the Most High. Now, those of you who are sitting there saying, I can't wait to get out of here. I can't wait to get a glorified body well you're going to get one and while you get one and your your feet are up in the air you're going uh, because of the rapture you're going to recall that as you're going up there are people thousands and thousands and thousands of people left behind and so everything that you're supposed to be doing now is going to come out later on when you go up because we're all going to know who played ball. What I mean by that, we're going to know who was consistently serving God because when we are face-to-face -face with Christ, we're going to stand in judgment, not for salvation purposes, not to determine if we're saved or not, not to determine if we're going to hell or not, or the lake of fire or not, but to determine the rewards that are rightfully ours, the crowns that belong to us as the scripture taught. So we're going to see who was consistent, see who was lackadaisical, see who did not serve regularly, consistently, prioritizing God, all that's going to be revealed, not to be displayed on a giant screen or anything, but you're just going to know for yourself. And I have a sense that as we're being judged, 
for our works. We're going to be able to know and possibly because I think I don't think God is going to have us stand up there one at a time. There's going to be a myriad and myriads of people standing there. So I can't imagine. Well, have you been to the DMV lately? You know, those lines are long, right? I don't think he's going to have us stand in line and say, G4, G8, H4, ZM, or Z3. I don't think it's going to be like that because that'll spend, that'll take a lot of time. I think what's going to happen is that we're going to all be there and then we're going to all get judged during the Bema Seat of Christ, the Bema Seat Judgment of Christ, and we're going to stand there and he's just going to somehow just go and say, okay, Freddie Cortez, one crown. Uh, Jasmine, Karen, Steve, Winston, Don, we're, we're all going to stand and I think he's just going to either call our names or we're just going to all stand up at the same time and we're just going to be bestowed and given the rewards either simultaneously, all at the same time. I, I don't know, but I can't imagine he's just going to spend the rest of eternity spend divvy, divvying out what who gets what. That'll, spend, that'll take a long time. I know nothing's impossible for God, but I can't imagine him going through all the believers and saying, okay, let's open the books. Okay, Freddie did two good deeds. Oh, wait, wait, turn the page. He did four. I don't think he's going to do that. I think it's just going to be instantaneous. It's going to happen at a rapid rate. We're all going to be up on our feet, and he's just going to just one by one, just giving us what we need or what rightfully belongs to us. And when that happens, I think we're just going to have a, a, a per, um peripheral vision of who did what and who's getting what that's just my personal opinion uh, it's not like we're gonna say ah oh, you only did that i don't think it's gonna be like that we're gonna be all there just grateful for the fact that we're in the presence of god a sovereign supreme being there's angels galore all around us watching us as we're standing before the lord's feet and i i mean we're there and we're being judged for our works. Remember, we're going to be judged for our works. We're going to be judged and we're going to sit here, at least for ourselves, what we did, how we fared, and he's going to give us rewards. And we're going to sit there and say, Lord, you're, you're the one worthy of this. I'm not even worthy. We're going to want to give it back. And I think we will be able to, but the fact that he's going to give us something, I mean, to me, I don't think we. I would want to take it. I would just say, Lord, you you deserve it. I mean, I'm just your servant. I'm just, I. you gave me salvation. That's, this is the least I can do. And then we're going to probably give it back to him, throw the crowns at his feet. I've heard all sorts of perspectives and they're all, they're all sound and some of them are backed up with scripture. But the fact that he's even going to even give us something, that tells me that he wants to reward us. So, I mean, if he's going to reward us and all we're going to do is fling it back to him, I'm not sure he's going to even give us anything so that we can fling it back to him. Because he wants us to know that what we did was worthy of a reward. I mean, this is the reason why he, it's recorded in Scripture that there are biblical rewards. There is co-ruling, co-reigning, crowns, jewels, I mean, gold, silver, precious stones. So these things, nobody really knows, but these things are in the scripture and they're forthcoming. So rather than sit there and argue back and forth with the Lord, I'm just going to sit there and say, okay, well, if that's what you think, that's what you believe, then who am I to argue with you? Because if this was thought through in eternity past, then nothing is going to change his mind, right? So if that's what he wants to do for each and every one of us, then we should just bow our heads and say, well, thank you, Lord. If that's how you feel about our service to you, Lord, you are worthy of this plus more. So, I mean, the fact that you're giving it and the fact that it came from you, 
you probably have boatloads boatloads more in where it came from, right? So maybe that just is gonna be something that we all get. Each one of us are gonna be able, hey, I'll give you five uh, rubies for 10 emeralds, you know, who knows? But I just know this, we will be given rewards. So now's the time to take your walk with God serious because he will judge you. He will determine what is forthcoming for your service for him. So how that's going to look like later on, nobody really knows. So verse 10, because you have kept my command to persevere. So there are certain things we can see here. You have kept my command to persevere. I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So there is a sense here that certain words are pregnant and full of meaning so that when we sit there and we look at it, you have kept my command to persevere. Have I kept his command to persevere and endure and to keep on going on? So I take these things and I say, okay, I'm just going to, I'm not going to rush through it and say, oh, well, he kept my command to persevere. I have to sit there and pay attention You've kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole earth, the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. So contextually, we have to know that it's recorded and stated for a specific church, but in, in the scheme of things, in the big picture, we know what it takes to be a part of the family, right? That's faith alone and Jesus Christ alone. But there are things recorded for us to pay close attention. So if he's talking to the church here and you cut my command to persevere, then likewise, by principle of continuity, we should be thinking about, well, am I persevering? Am I pressing on? Am I serving him? Am I not denying him by my words, by my actions, by my lifestyle? I have to consider that. And if I'm not, I need to make adjustments because God is paying attention. If he's bringing uh, statements like this to bear and in front of the church, then we need to be ready to answer this as well. So that's what I'm seeing here. So verse 10, now verse 11, behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have that no one may take your what? Take your crown. So it's the idea that you could lose your crown. So Christ remain, reminds his people that he is coming quickly. Therefore, they are to hold fast, to hold a firm grip on this, uh, be consistent to what? Their obedience and perseverance right up to the end to give up on the following Christ because of persecution and opposition is to allow the enemies of Christ to take your crown. So let me read that again. Christ reminds his people that he's coming quickly. So he's going to return. Therefore, they are to hold fast to their obedience and perseverance right up to the end to give up on following Christ because of persecution and opposition is to allow the enemies of Christ to take your crown. So you don't want to give up. You don't want to back off because of resistance and opposition and tension and frustration. Don't let that bother you. Because if you do, you could forfeit your crown. That's the idea here. The sense of what we're seeing in Revelation 3, 11. That is to allow them to cause you to forfeit the ultimate eternal reward of ruling with Christ forever in his kingdom as compared to 2 Timothy 2, 12 to 13. In this verse, Jesus speaks of his imminent return, emphasizing the urgency of the message, the instructions to hold fast and encourage believers to remain steadfast in their faith and commitment guarding against any influences that may lead them astray. The mention of the crown implies the reward for faithfulness, suggesting that maintaining a strong and unwavering faith is crucial as they await Christ's return. So likewise, we're waiting for the return of Christ. Technically, I, you know, the wording here, 
is uh, I should have changed. I shouldn't have used that. The, I should have said the rapture, but because of the timing and when this is recorded, I'm clarifying it now. We're not really looking for the return of Christ because we're looking for the rapture of Christ. The, the rapture of Christ, not the return, because the return um, is second coming terminology or phraseology. But because it's recorded for this particular church, I'm saying the return because this whole context of the tribulation and so on. And so we're looking for, in our time, the rapture of the church, not the return of church uh, of Christ, the rapture, not the return, because con chronologically we're looking forward to the rapture. We're not looking forward to the return. We're not in the tribulation. And so I should have, um, well, I know it's going to, specify that as we go through this revelation 3 11 now 12 he who overcomes i will make him a pillar in the temple of my god and he shall go out no more i will write on him the name of my god and the name of the city of my god the new jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my god and i will write on him my new name. So the idea here is Christ's commitment to the overcomer is that I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God with the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, and my new name inscribed on the pillar. This is a picture of stability and security. In this verse, Jesus promises special rewards to those who over, overcomes challenges and remains faithful. So regardless of the challenges, when you hit a roadblock, when you hit difficulty, when you hit challenges, by continuity, by principle, we can say, yeah, I'm going through hardship. And this is very hard to sustain. This is difficult. But when you press on the promises of reward to those who overcome challenges and remain faithful becomes a con. Uh, that allows us to know that God is paying attention and rewards are forthcoming. The imagery of becoming a pillar in the temple of God symbolizes stability, permanence, and a close relationship with God. The writing of God's name and the name of the new Jerusalem on the overcomer signifies belonging and identification with the divine. It's a profound promise of honor and distinctions for those who persevere in them faith. So it's very important to see what's uh, recorded in Revelation 3 as he's just talking to the local churches, the seven churches here. So once you kind of uh, pull out the, the information that's recorded here, you can have a sense of how He's addressing the local churches here and you get, you can see how he's observant and how he's kind of encouraging and exhorting them to press on. There's a, there's a common thread among all these churches, whether it's a rebuke, whether he's talking about uh, their lackadaisical attitude or their fortitude, he brings that out and he either reprimands them or he encourages them. And he says, well, here's what's forthcoming. This is what you're, you're going to see, I'm going to inscribe your name here on, on the temple. And so there's these rewards that are forthcoming for their perseverance and their ongoing faith. And as they continue to overcome challenges. And so it's a way to encourage the, the churches today to remain focused and moving on and moving on and moving on. Because you see the hand of God, you see the mind of God, the the love of God that's displayed in the books of the Bible. And it encourages us because, you know, to, to be honest, the churches around the world, this is going through massive, going through massive challenges today. And it's not just our local church in California or even here in Virginia. It's church, it's churches all over the world. Some churches have it harder than our church. They're having difficulty far more than us because their lives are being uh, threatened. Not only were the early church threatened, their lives were threatened and literally martyred. People were martyred for their faith, but we have we know of people today 
who whose lives are being threatened and whose lives have been threatened and died because of their faith. We don't have any issues today. We think we do, but we not compared to other people who've had to die for their faith. The hardship we have is just continuing to assemble together. And when we remain faithful and pulling together because of a, a local assembly for him and his presence as a beacon of light in our locale, that I believe is going to be a special reward because there's only a handful that I could think of of people that continue to pull together in a very special way to advance the cause of Christ. Think about it. Those of you in California, the, the nucleus there in California, and I know there's some of you online, but you, you can hear this as well. The ones in California, you are doing a superb job doing far more than some of the bigger churches. The bigger churches have a building and they have all the fancy pizzazz and people there. Uh, yet, is God being honored in some of these churches? I Hopefully they are, but many of many of them are not. They're teaching things that go contrary to sound doctrine. And so they're going to be held accountable for that. And so you all are to be commended because you continue to consistently sacrifice your time and your efforts and your energies to make it possible. I mean, that is phenomenal. Phenomenal. Think about this. What is God thinking when he sees you? When he sees us? I mean, I could just be focused over here. I could just be doing my own thing and just saying, well, yeah, I, yeah, I got something over here. I don't really have to make sacrifices over there. I could do the same. I could easily just say the same thing. But I haven't seen or heard anything as of yet. God has still continued to impress upon me the importance of maintaining a pivot there with you all. As long as we're locking shields together, I mean, I don't think the adversary appreciates that. I think he's pretty ticked off, to be honest. I think the fact that you guys are holding the fort there Nobody else is doing what we're doing. I mean, it's hard to do what you're doing and it's easy to gather together doing what everybody else is doing just because there are people there and they have things that could keep them going. It's not even a sacrifice. It's just a matter of driving to the parking lot, going to their campus and going to church. Whereas for us, we have to, we got to think about, oh my gosh, okay, probably the same group, the same people. What, what is it really worth it? I mean, think about it. You, you just have to collectively say in your mind, in your own heart, soul, and mind and say, well, what's the purpose and function of why we do what we do? And if you, if you're saying with a genuine heart, well, you know, I am a part of this church I, I do believe in, in creating and fostering and nurturing a place and a location so that people can come and learn about God and his word because we do it a little differently from the other churches. If that's how you see it, then you're doing it for the right reasons. And if you do, I believe that's rewardable in the eyes of God. And so again, big picture is, is it a sacrifice? Oh, yes, it is. I, I'm, I'm encouraged and I, it, it, it challenges me and exhorts me to continue to do what I'm doing because I could do the same thing too. But like I said, just coming out here was already a God moment and you all already know that, right? So I followed his lead and I, I saw what the leading uh, resulted in and so you all know why we do what we do so the big picture is as we're moving through revelation 3 i sometimes think about us what we have been doing and those who are joining us online being a part of this very special and unique ministry 
I think that every one of us are going to be rewarded in a very special way because God is going to say, this person, this person, this person, this person, help pray for the ministry, it sustain the ministry and continue to uh, be a part of it. And so everybody's encouraged synergistically, dynamically, everyone is, sees a purpose behind it and it continued to thrive. And then finally, when we're, Face to face, when that time comes, I think it's just going to be a massive radical change when we're finally face to face. But at the same time, I, I, there's so many things going on. There's this these changes with the health uh, scene again. I don't know what to think anymore, but we're plugged in. We're already ready for it. There's nothing that can tamper with what we're currently doing. So. We're already rock solid in all phases of our ministry. So the leadership team there is to be commended and all of you as well, as you continue to pull together and assist it in every way possible with your presence, your offering, your contributions, your prayer, all of that matters. Everything matters and it's rewardable in the eyes of God. So now let's move on to, let me let we look at 12. Yes, we looked at 12 already. So now 13. You, you see this repeatedly, right? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The idea here again is that to hear this warning against having a religious profession without ever having a relationship with Christ is not good. This verse reiterates the call to attentive listening and understanding of the spiritual guidance provided to the churches. And that includes us as well, okay? A few more things we're going to look at, and then we'll, we'll conclude and resume this next week. Verse 14, to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, these things says the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Who do you think that's referring to? As the amen... Christ makes a definitive declaration to a church desperately in need of truth, also known as Bible doctrine. Because the Laodiceans bore, bore false witness, I am rich, and it goes on and on and on. You'll see this as we move through this. To their true spiritual condition, the faithful and the true witness comes to them with an accurate and unbiased assessment. So now Jesus Christ is coming along and is now going to assess the reality and the true picture of the church of Laodicea. Jesus identifies himself as the amen, emphasizing the faithfulness and truthfulness. And the title, the beginning and the end of the creation of God, underscores his role in creation and sovereignty over all things. This introduction sets the stage for the specific message addressed to the church of Laodicea in the following verses. So that's verse 14. You get to verse 15. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. You've heard this verse numerous times, I'm sure. It's one of the most popular verses in the Bible. Because you always hear of this, oh, well, I wish you were cold or hot, but because you're neither, I spit you out, I spat you out. So the idea here is God says, don't straddle the fence, be hot or cold. Don't, you can't be both, you can't be lukewarm. It's like coffee, make it cold or hot, not warm. You can't drink, or water actually. You can't drink warm water. I know people who do, but it's better either nice and cold or hot. Hot for your coffee, hot for your tea, but cold, if you're going to have it cold, cold for your soda or, you know, um, but you can't have uh, lukewarm water. So I know your works that you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. Don't straddle the fence is the idea. So the judge found nothing in this church at Laodicea to commend. That's a big no-no. Their works were 
were not like cold water that refreshes or like hot water that soothes and stimulates. They had no cool water for the spiritual, spiritually thirsty people around them. You got the you can compare that with John 4, 13 to 14, what Jesus says there. Nor were they hot enough spiritually to stir up one another's faith. So the idea here is that a local church should have sound doctrine to stimulate their faith in him, their faith in God's word, so that it would encourage growth. That's the whole idea here, that when you see this whole idea, you're either cold or hot, but I wish you were cold or hot. Don't straddle the fence. And so they had no cool water for the spiritually thirsty people around them, nor were they hot enough to stir up one another's faith. And so that's the whole sense of Revelation 3.15 for the church at Laodicea. So what we'll see next week is the, the pushing on in Revelation 3, where he says, very popular passage, I stand at the door and knock. And he's talking to the same church, and we're going to see how this results in uh, some of the most popular um, interpretations of uh, the heart. You know, I stand at the door and knock on a person's heart. We'll see that how this um, has evolved to a popular Bible tract where you're supposed to ask Jesus into your heart. I'll just, I've shared this before, but I'll show you the verse again as far as where it's found and why it's very popular today and show you that it's not contextually correct, theologically correct, and it's not accurate at all. So we'll just look at it next week and see what we should do with that so that we can make sense of it and not mishandle the word of God. So for now, let's just close in a word of prayer and we'll resume this next week, okay? So thank you for your time and thank you for your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And just know, based on what we've covered thus far, those online and those in person in Elisa Viejo, just know Based on what we've seen, God is observing our actions. He sees what we do. He sees our challenges. He sees our commitment levels. And like he said in Revelation 3, he's going to spare us from the tribulation. He's going to reward us in the future because we're prioritizing him. So the book is laced with numerous things there that we can draw from so that we can see that God is watching us. And so although it takes a lot of sacrifice, a lot of work, he sees that. And in the end, he's going to reward us for it. And like I said earlier, you guys are doing a phenomenal job because I don't know very many people doing what we're doing. So that makes us very unique, very special. And if I didn't think it was worthwhile, I would have said, guys, let's just close up shop and we don't need to do this. And the adversary would be laughing his head off saying, see, we lost another one and they, they gave up because of A, B, C, D. And so we don't have to do that because we have a good solid group there who believe in God. Uh, and I think if we keep things going, it provides opportunity for those that we would reach out to, to come alongside and learn the truth of God's word. Remember, we're not just covering Revelation. There's going to be other truths that we're going to study that are going to be part of the, the spiritual advance in the believer's life. In fact, um, I think we should be looking soon, I just covered it today, between the rewards and the gift of salvation side by side so that we can see the verses and how they are uniquely different while at the same time they share some similarity. And so now that we're moving through a new year, it would be nice to see the rewards versus the, the gift of salvation side by side where we can navigate through it and say, oh, that verse is for this. That, that verse relates to phase one. That verse relates to phase two because it's kind of like salvation. You will see and appreciate the verses that we're all familiar with, but how in our minds, once we dial that in, 
we're going to be able to say, okay, that relates to phase two. That relates to phase two. This also relates to phase two. This one, however, relates to phase one. And once you start seeing the connection and how they go here, there, here, there, then you're going to say, ah, this is phenomenal. This is what God has done for me. And so once you see that in a side-by-side -side format, I think you'll really enjoy it. So maybe uh, I'll see when we can look at that. Uh, and when we do, I'll let you know so that you can invite people either online or in person. But for now, let's close in a word of prayer and I will see you next week unless uh, or this week if you are going to join us during the Bible studies. So for now, let's uh, bow our heads and close in a word of prayer and I'll see you soon. Father, thank you as always for giving us the opportunity to examine your word. We've, uh, we're trekking through the book of Revelation and we know that this is important for us to see what's forthcoming. And we know, Lord, that uh, we will not be here long. We'll be raptured out of here. So a lot of this is just going to be facts that are forthcoming, but we won't be a part of it because we will be gone face to face with you. To be absent from the body is to be present with you, present with the Lord. We thank you for that, um, that biblical truth there for us to be encouraged by. We pray now, Father, that you would uh, go before us and uh, allow us to enjoy the fellowship that will follow. Keep us all safe as we continue to put you first in all that we say, think, and do. We ask and pray all of these things through Christ's matchless name in which we pray. Amen. Take care, everyone. God bless you all. Bye-bye.